Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. I want to share a message with you called Why We All Need Easter. Whether we know it or not, we all need Jesus. And we all need what he accomplished on the cross and how he conquered the grave. We all need that. There's a good reason why we can be joyful amid despair and live a new life that looks nothing like our past. I hope to make sense of why we all need Easter so life will make better sense moving forward. Amen. You see, the greatest problem in the world is not the economy. It's not warfare or healthcare and all the issues that we're seeing in our world. I could go on and on and on, couldn't I? The greatest problem that runs through all humanity, no matter where we live or where we come from, is sin. Yes, the word sin. Something that the world's trying to ignore right now or dismiss. All other problems in our world, which are serious, and we care about those as well. The only problem is they are just symptoms of the real issue going on. Our world likes to treat the symptoms, but God likes to treat the source of the problem. We need Easter because God addresses humanity's greatest need. He doesn't put a Band-Aid on all the hemorrhaging that's going on in our world. He looks past all that and he sees that all these terrible things are happening because mankind is still broken and needs to be changed. We all need Easter because number one, we all have sinned and the wages of sin is death. And I think we all agree that's not good. Death here means eternal separation from God. Not just physical death, but eternal separation from God. Here's what the Bible teaches us. No one is righteous, not even one person. Newsflash for anyone? Of course not. We all know we're not perfect. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. What's his glorious standard? Holiness, righteousness, perfection. We all fall short of that. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. And lastly, for the wages of sin is death. The result of sin is death, and that's not good. There's, there's a good part to that line later. This has been called the problem of sin, or humanity's fall into sin. And here's what it is. Primarily, sin caused separation between us and God. Spiritual, physical, relational separation. Isaiah 59, one through two says, listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is his ear too deaf to hear you call. God can save people. God wants to save people. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. Do you know who he's talking to here? 700 years before Christ, he was talking to his own people. They turned their backs on him. He rescued them from slavery in Egypt and they now have turned their back on him. So he's not even necessarily talking to the unbelievers of his day. He's talking to the people that he rescued and his ear has turned deaf towards them because they continued in sin. See, in the beginning, we had a relationship and fellowship with God, but sin put a relational and spiritual distance between us. And to sin is to disobey or rebel against God, and this is what Adam and Eve did. And sin entered the world through Adam, and its corruption spreads to all people, including us. And that glorious standard is perfection, it's holiness, it's righteousness, and how many know none of us meet up to that standard? God knows that. God knows that we could never meet up to that standard. But God, in his grace and in his mercy, wanted to still be in fellowship with us. So he didn't stay far away from us the entire time. Do you know that God actually dwelt in a tabernacle or a tent? 
at the camp of his people. We can read about this in the Old Testament. He set up a camp because he wanted to be with us and he would be in the Ark of the Covenant. And as long as they did sin offerings by shedding the blood of an animal and sprinkling it over the altar and over the elements inside the tent, God would remain among his people because he longed to have a relationship with us even if we ran away. He still wanted to be with us. He wanted the garden experience. He wanted to to walk around with Adam and Eve still, but he couldn't because he's a holy, perfect God and he can't mix with sin. But what he did was he separated himself on earth through this tabernacle and there were boundaries around it and only one person could enter once a year and that was the high priest. His name was Aaron. And God was so holy that they had to tie a rope around Aaron's body just in case he did something wrong because he would die and they could pull him out. His holiness is that great, but yet he loves you so much that he was willing to set something up so that he could still be here with us. That's love, just so you know. Well, they would sprinkle this blood and and it was just, it was just for that moment, but it never really ever fixed humanity. And so when we go into the New Testament, we read about this person named Jesus. In Hebrews 10, one through seven says, the old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview, like a trailer of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped for the worshipers would have been purified once for all time and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. What is he talking about here? To take away the sins of the whole world once and for all time. No physical animal at that time, and by the way, it wasn't just God's people who practiced sacrifices. Other nations did this as well, okay? No physical animal was working to completely take away their guilt. And this is where there's a quote here. It's Jesus speaking. You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you gave me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in the scriptures. You see, Jesus knew the assignment. He understood his assignment that none of the other lambs or animals were working. And so he said, I know that those aren't enough. So now I'm going to give myself for who? For sinners. Our world wants to dismiss sin altogether as if it doesn't exist. Some may admit sin and evil exists, but they, they say they're not guilty of it. Some just choose to ignore it and just keep going on in life. Some admit sin and evil exists, but simply rebel because they don't believe God exists. So therefore, maybe this whole word about sin and, and such, it just doesn't exist. There's a lot of views that you could go on and on and on here, but here's the truth. We're all feeling the ripple effects, the consequences and the pain of sin, aren't we? Are you here? You hear me? Listen, you look outside, you watch the news, you go around the world and we're seeing the effects of sin. The oppression that we see in our world, that's what the devil wants. That's what sin wants. The addictions, That's what sin wants. That's what the devil wants. The fighting, the warfare, all that kind of stuff, that is what the devil and sin want. They want to destroy mankind and we're all feeling the effects of sin. We need to wake up and see it. It's real. Don't dismiss it today. It's affected your life too, hasn't it? Even in our aching bodies, sickness, Cancer, all these things have come into our world because of sin. And the world is groaning for Jesus to come back to fix it all. We're all groaning. We want him. Deep down, whether you realize or not, you want what Jesus has to offer. He offers the perfect life with no pain, no more sorrow. Not necessarily right now, but in the future, new heavens and the new earth. In fact, everything that we're longing for everything that we are dying to have, 
Think about this. We're, we're trying to live longer. We're trying to get surgeries and things, right? So our face doesn't age. I get it, okay. Beauty is fleeting now. Our bodies are decaying, but what can be inside is a eternal life, the next life. Amen. I talk to a lot of people and they go, they get mad at God for things. We need to put our finger at sin and the devil. And unfortunately, even ourselves. Because it was mankind that fell in the garden, not God. God didn't walk away from mankind. Mankind walked away from God. If our great, this is Max Lucado, a pastor, a theologian. He says this, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness, so God sent us a savior. Praise God. And let me tell you something today to prepare your hearts. God gives grace to those who humble themselves and see their sin. It actually says, the Bible says that those who are prideful, he comes against. You don't want God against you. And you don't want what's coming in the end. But to those who humble themselves, he gives grace. In other words, he helps them. And he's given us Jesus to do that. Secondly, we all need Easter because we need the cross of Christ to pay the penalty for our sins. You see, the first issue, sin is the problem. But this is the solution. Jesus is the solution. If you ever need a reminder of how awful and ugly sin is, look at the cross. But at the same time, if you ever need a reminder of how much God loves you, look at the cross. Look at the cross. It's our sin that put a perfect, innocent man on the cross. So that is ugly and disturbing in all its forms to let an innocent man die for us when we're the ones guilty. But it's the love of God for you because you couldn't pay the penalty for your sin. There is no perfect person, right? We all fall short of God's glorious standard except for one person, Jesus Christ. And he was enough for you and all of your sin. Romans 5 Six through eight says, when we were utterly helpless, we couldn't save ourselves. Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. You know, we would give our life for someone who's a good person, right? We would jump in front of a bullet or something, right? Just to save that person. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. In other words, he died when we were a bad person. I hope you know this truth. This is his love. God did this with full knowledge of our sin. And even Jesus on the cross said, as he's being mocked and all those things and nailed to the cross, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. While he's on the cross, he saves a criminal on his side who realizes his need for Jesus. Even while he's dying, he's saving people. What is he going to do if he rises again? <laughs> Praise the Lord. I have more scripture for you. We believe in teaching the Bible here. Because you don't need fancy words from Pastor Ryan. You need the Bible. And 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right or righteous with God through Christ. You see, you are only made righteous if you have Christ covering over you, his blood, spiritually. Isaiah 53, 3 through 6, again, 700 years before Jesus was crucified, the prophet Isaiah said this, he was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. He knew what we were going through, church and friends. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. 
yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. No, 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 no. See, he was sinless. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He actually walked the right path. We're the ones that walked away. And yet God took all of our sin combined and put it on Jesus on the cross because only he could actually save us from sin. D.A. Carson, another pastor and theologian said, it was not the nails that held Jesus to that wretched cross. It was his unqualified resolution out of love for his father to do his father's will. And it was his love for sinners like me. It was his love. When Jesus was on that cross, he was thinking of us. He knew we couldn't save ourselves. You know that God had a plan before time began. Before he created everything, he had a plan to save us. He had a plan to save us. He knew you. He knew that you're going to need him. Thank God the story doesn't end there. Dr. Tony Evans once said, Jesus didn't say, I am finished. He says, it is finished. He was just getting started. Matthew 28, 1 through 10, early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone and sat on it. His face shone like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the woman, don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come see where his body was lying and now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. He is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I've told you. The woman ran quickly from the tomb. They were frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee and they will see me there. My friends, Jesus rose from the grave. Praise the Lord. We all need Easter because the resurrection of Jesus provides new life now and eternal life forevermore. You don't have to wait for the blessing of Jesus when you get to eternity. Now you can have resurrection life, a brand new life. Romans 6, 23, remember this verse, for the wages of sin is death? There's good news. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's Easter in one line. Remember the blood of the animals? Hebrews 9, 12. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once and for all time and secured our redemption forever. He secured our salvation. There will be no more Jesuses out there. There is no other but the one, the Son of God. Amen. There is no other Messiah but Jesus Christ. Listen, if you're looking for some other way to heaven and it's outside of Jesus, it's going to fail. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man shall come to the Father except through me. There is no other Messiah coming. There is no other way. It's through Jesus Christ. Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus had to reinstate him, had to remind him of who he is. In spite of his failures and his faults as a disciple, I'm sure Peter had a repentant heart. He felt terrible about it. He was sorrowful for it. And Jesus had to reinstate him. And Peter writes these words later on in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4. All praise to God, 
the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again or saved because of, because God raised Jesus from the dead, now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that's kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, uncorrupted, beyond the reach of change and decay. My friends, this is what you have to look forward to and what you can experience now on earth. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why is the resurrection so important? Why are we so excited today? Because the resurrection proves that Jesus defeats the power of sin and the power of death. Amen. Just understand this today. If he did not rise again, then he wasn't the son of God. All that he said about himself was a lie if he didn't rise again. And there would be no answer for sin there would be no answer for death and our faith is useless as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. We would be in trouble. The problem would still be a problem and there would be no solution. But because Jesus did rise again, we are assured that he has overcame sin for us and that he also offers eternal life. And that is the hope that we have here and now. That is why we can be bold and courageous and not afraid of what we're going through in our world. It's why we can endure trials on earth because we know that this is not the end. That's why Christians can be and ought to be smiling even when things are going south in our world. They, people should see a difference in us. We should be people that are different than everyone else because we know this is not the end. The resurrection of Christ provides new life now. Romans 5, 18 says, yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. When we give our life to Christ and we get saved, our, our heart should change about our lives and how we live. 2 Corinthians 5, 15 and 17 he died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Because we're selfish people, aren't we? Come on, let's be real. Come on, we think of ourselves so much. But no longer will we live for ourselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. Verse 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ, anyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. That means you're a new creation. You're a new person in God's eyes. Let me explain that for a little bit here. If the resurrection of Christ is the death of death, which I believe it is, death has been defeated through Christ. And the forgiveness of sin then is also the forgiveness of sin. So we have forgiveness of sin, the, the death of death, then life should be different now for all who put their faith in him. Christ comes into our lives at salvation. So this means the corruption of sin and the brokenness that came with it cannot continue ruling in us. If Jesus defeated death and then he comes and lives in us through salvation, then all those things that, that are from sin and all the corruption should no longer have power over us because Jesus defeated sin and death, which means we should have a brand new life. Amen. Praise God. In other words, for where Christ is, there is freedom from addictions. There's freedom and hope. There's joy, there's peace, there's love, and there's faith. If the grip of death is gone and the promise of eternal life is waiting us, certainly the grip of despair Certainly the grip of fear or the conflict in your life or the hate that you experience or the worry or the burdens and much more should let go because he's defeated death. Surely he can defeat anything that's gripping in your life right now. The old life is gone. When we give our life to Jesus, the old life is gone with all of its shame and regret. And that's the hardest part sometime, isn't it? It's hard to, to try to forget what you've done and move on. It's hard. But 
here's the reality, here's the truth. As far as the east is from the west, he has forgiven us. He has casted away our sins. In other words, we're not gonna be able to find him. We'll go east, we'll go west, and he has taken away our shame and our guilt and we are forgiven. It's hard to believe, isn't it? It's hard to understand. It's his grace, it's his righteousness over us that reminds us that we are forgiven. We all need Easter because brokenness caused by sin can be fixed and made whole. We can endure and overcome trials because of Christ. We can live with joy in the face of despair because Jesus lives in us. God did this for you because of his love and desire to be with you forever. God invites us to turn away from sin, to believe and receive the gift of salvation and eternal life. So the question is, is how? How does someone receive this amazing love and salvation? Romans 3.25 tells us, for God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Let me explain this for just a moment here. We're going to land the plane here in a moment, okay? <laughs> we can't buy his forgiveness. Going to church doesn't save you. Doing good deeds doesn't save you. Praying a prayer at the end of this service isn't what saves you. It's what Jesus did on the cross and in the empty tomb that saves you. All you can do is believe that, receive it. But here's the thing, a lot of people miss. It's not an intellectual belief. It's a heart belief. And a lot of people miss this too. It's a belief that you are wrong and he is right. The biblical word we use for that is repentance. It means we turn away from our way of doing life we turn away from what we think is the right way and we take on the way that Jesus has, has offered for us. It's believing that he's right and I'm wrong and the way I'm doing life isn't working. The way he does it works because he did it on the cross for us and the grave. It's believing that I need to change my ways and that I can't even figure that out without Jesus. Let me tell you something. If you try to change the way that God wants you to change without Jesus, you're in trouble. It's not gonna work. You need Jesus to come into you. When we believe in Jesus Christ for salvation, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity comes into your life and his name is Holy Spirit, right? If we don't have the Holy Spirit, how do we live a holy life? The Holy Spirit comes into us. Jesus dwells in us through the Holy Spirit and he helps us live the righteous life that the Bible calls us to live. That's what we need. So in a moment, I'm gonna give you an invitation to respond today. There's no important meet, uh, uh, moment in, in this day than this moment right now. I'm sure your ham is gonna be amazing today. <laughs> whatever chicken, sides, whatever you like, restaurant will be there. There's no more important moment in this time today than to give your life to Jesus. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. What, is it, what a tragedy that happened in Baltimore recently for lives to be taken out of nowhere. My heart thought, did they know about Jesus yet? We are not guaranteed tomorrow. And if Jesus were to come back, would you be ready? Would you have the righteousness of Christ, the blood of Christ over you so that when God sees you, he goes, oh, you've been forgiven. You've accepted my son. Come on in. I see Jesus' blood on you. Because that's what they did. They literally took the blood of an animal and they sprinkled everything. And it's, it's interesting, right? Because blood stains things, right? And it's hard to get blood stains out. 
I got a bloody nose on a shirt. I couldn't get that out. I had to throw it away. But the blood of Jesus is like a detergent that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We need his blood. And I would encourage you today to not say, oh, I'm good. I, don't, I'm, I think I'm okay. No, why not know? Why not know that you know that you know that you're covered in the blood of Jesus Christ and that you have Jesus in your life? There's probably a few people here today. If you're here, you've never believed in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. In just a minute, we're gonna pray a prayer. And again, this prayer doesn't save you. It's in your heart, what you decide to do with Jesus and what he's done for you. Here's the thing. He's done everything. He's just waiting for us to decide. He's done everything he can. There's not gonna be a cross again. There won't be another grave again. It has been done. He's waiting for people. He longs for people. He's delaying his return because he wants people to be saved. He doesn't want people to go to hell. He wants people to be saved. We must humble ourselves because he gives grace to the humble. And if you feel like you're unworthy of being loved and forgiven today, you're wrong. He loves you and he wants to save you today. I don't care if your sins line up from that door over to that door because you've sinned so much. His grace is greater than all those sins. His one decision is greater than all those sins. Maybe you're here today and you remember believing in Jesus in your past, but you've become distant from God and you want to recommit yourself to him today. I would encourage you to do that. And again, maybe you just want to know that you know that you know. And we can do it right where we are right now, where you are. Why don't we stand together? We're going to sing another song. We're going to worship God and we're going to sing. But, and this, this song actually talks about everything I just preached on. But right here in this moment, is the most important moment for you. Would you believe in him today for the only solution for our sin and really our world to be changed? And it changes with us one at a time. Would you believe in him today? Would you give your life to him? right where you are. Let's close our eyes. Let's just begin to reflect on this. Let's just begin to pray. Because I want you to think about this. I want you to visualize Jesus on the cross. When we were worshiping earlier, I was watching in my mind Jesus carrying the cross and until Simon had to help him and I was watching him being nailed to the cross. That's why the song's called Suffering Servant. He served us by suffering for us. And it should have been us. And he's looking right at you saying, I love you. I'm doing this for you because I want you to be with me forever. I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want you to experience eternal death. I want to have a relationship with you. I did this for you. And right where you are, you can believe that he died for you on the cross and trust him alone to forgive you of your sins. And as soon as you do this, you are adopted into the family of God. You are now gonna have an ongoing relationship with him. If that's you, would you bravely and courageously just raise your hand for me? That's me, I wanna be saved today. Wow, yeah, there's hands going up everywhere. Praise God. I give my life to Jesus today. I trust in him for salvation. Maybe you're recommitting, just raise your hand. I'm recommitting my, recommitting my life to you today, God. Oh, wow, yeah. Dozens of people putting their hands up. Thank you, Lord. Now, remember this, this prayer, you already made, you're already believing right now. So technically right now, you are already saved. Praise God. But we're gonna just pray this prayer as a moment to confess it with our mouths, as the word of God says. So you can repeat after me, dear God, thank you so much for sending your son 
to die in my place for my sins. I believe Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and rose again. I trust in him to forgive me for all my sins. And I receive today the gift of eternal life through faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. The Bible says that even if one sinner repents of their sins, all of heaven is rejoicing. So we rejoice with you. We rejoice with you. Praise God. Do you know that this is great timing? April 21st, we're having a water baptism. And that's another public way of affirming your faith is to be water baptized, which means to be going into the water is to be wash of your old life and come out and be brand new with Jesus. So you're, you're showing that symbolically to the world, to all who attend that service, you're showing them that, you know what, I'm following Jesus. I'm with Jesus and I'm gonna follow him all the days of my life. So I wanna encourage you. We're doing a water baptism on April 21st. I wanna encourage you to sign up on our website. It's under the events uh, um, page. You can do that there. And also there's one more important thing. We have uh, salvation gift bags for you at the doors. Uh, do us a favor. We have a whole bag full of uh, stuff and resources for you. Fill this out, bring it on your way out the door so we can give you this bag. Or if you just didn't fill it out yet and you want the bag, do it. You can do this online today too. We wanna help you grow. This is just the beginning. And here's the reality. What you heard today is enough to start this relationship, okay? It's the gospel, it's the good news of Jesus. But there's so much more to learn about living a resurrected life, a brand new life. So we wanna help you with that. And we wanna come alongside you. We wanna be your church if you need a church. We have an amazing speaker coming next week from Convoy of Hope. And there's the work that we're doing around the world. He's, he's excited to share. You wanna hear what we're doing around the world. Uh, disaster relief in every country and everywhere. It's amazing. We wanna be part of your life and help you if you don't have a church. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're, gonna, we're gonna celebrate. And as you sing this song now as a new believer or a saved person, it's going to mean different now. It's going to be special. <laughs> special. I have a scripture for you, and I'll go. All right? <laughs> Hebrews 13, 20 through 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you, in other words, may he help you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. 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 There it is, church. There it is. Praise God.